1917, the sculptor Marcel Duchamp purchased a porcelain urinal from a hardware store, wrote R. Mutt 1917 on the side in bold black letters, and submitted it to the Society of Independent Artists under the name Fountain. The piece was rejected by the Society for reasons that remain somewhat unclear, but it caused quite the controversy in the art world. Some argued that it was not a genuine piece of art because it essentially amounted to plagiarism. They said that taking someone else's creation and putting it on display is forgery. Others, such as the photographer of this famous image, defended the urinal as a genuine piece of art and pointed out its supposed oriental qualities. He argued that the urinal was positioned to resemble a veiled woman or Buddha. One critic suggested that, on the contrary, Duchamp chose a urinal to demonstrate the meaninglessness of artwork as something that you piss on. Duchamp himself simply claimed that he wanted everyday objects raised to the dignity of a work of art. The controversy surrounding the fountain points to a fundamental characteristic of artwork in the modern period. Its meaning remains unclear. What am I supposed to think and feel about this? What am I looking at here? Is this aesthetically pleasing? It is often the case that unless one is formally trained in art history and theory, or has the assistance of an art interpreter, a trip to the gallery or confrontation with a piece of renowned artwork can be somewhat embarrassing. There was once a time where the meaning of art was collectively understood without such assistance. But today, no matter how long we gaze into a famous Renaissance painting, its meaning will not suddenly appear on the canvas without the aid of historical context. The modern epoch lacks a collective ideology of core beliefs and values, among other conditions, that allow for the meaning of art to be collectively agreed upon. Therefore, images have become vacuums of meaning that can be filled with boundless individual interpretation, and when the interpretation of art becomes individualized and boundless, what counts as art in the first place becomes boundless as well. This might briefly hint towards how a urinal ended up as a gallery exhibit, but it does not yet tell us anything about how we have arrived at such a condition where art takes this form. To answer that question, it is necessary to briefly analyze the material and social development of art throughout history. The compass for this discussion is based on the analysis of images in Walter Benjamin's The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. You can find a link to his essay in the description below. In the German ideology, Marx and Engels explain that men begin to distinguish themselves from animals as soon as they begin to produce their means of subsistence, a step which is conditioned by their physical organization. By producing their means of subsistence, men are indirectly producing their actual material life. They go on to argue that the production of ideas, of conceptions, of consciousness, is at first directly interwoven with the material activity and the material intercourse of men, the language of real life. Conceiving, thinking, the mental intercourse of men appear at this stage as the direct efflux of their material behavior. The same applies to mental production, as expressed in the language of politics, laws, morality, religion, metaphysics, etc. of a people. Marx and Engels argue that the social production of material life is the defining feature of the human species. Only once humans have organized social relations around material production does the economic base of society give rise to an ideological or cultural superstructure. If we apply the idea of base and superstructure to the production of art, we can say that in the production of material life, the artist produces art with the materials made available by society. But the artist also brings his consciousness, furnished by the totality of his social interactions, into the artwork. The work of art is therefore a product of both the material and social relations of a given society. In this way, we can distinguish between the form and the content of art. The form that art takes is determined by the materials available for its production, such as the type of medium, the type of tool, the types of raw materials, and so on. 
This physical aspect of the art is directly rooted in the economic base of society, or more specifically, in the forces of production. The content of the art, however, is an image of society that is shaped by the social relations that give rise to its production, such as religion, tradition, social inequality, war, and so on. This social aspect of art is based on the relations of production within the economic base, as well as the various corresponding ideological manifestations within the superstructure. For example, one of the most significant developments in the history of art was in the invention of oil-based paint at the dawn of the Renaissance. Other forms of paint had previously been used since the earliest human societies, but were generally only useful for creating two-dimensional images. Watercolor paint, for example, required artists to complete their work in a limited amount of time, which also limited the scope and detail of what they could create. However, after a new formula for oil paint was introduced, a much greater range of color and detail, as well as a sense of depth, could now be achieved. It also became possible for artists to leave their work and return to it the next day, opening up a great range of possibilities that were realized in the masterpieces of this era. The new material and social relations of the Renaissance period dramatically reshaped both the form of art as well as the content of what was produced in the artwork itself. During the Renaissance period, art was one of the highest luxuries, and the Catholic Church, which held a large sum of wealth as well as the desire for prestige, commissioned many of the great pieces of world-renowned art. For the Church and society more broadly, the usefulness of artwork, the intention and purpose behind its production, was to reflect a collective sentiment that was shared among the community. European churches from the Renaissance era are now one of the few lasting examples of this history. Art within the church was bound to and inseparable from the meaning of the religious traditions it reflected. The entire material composition of the church was imbued with symbolism. The architecture, floor design, spatial layout, ceiling height, window lighting, sculptures and paintings, and so on. The artwork within the church is meant to be observed within the church alone. Its reference is to the setting, the other artwork, and the church members. It remains today as it had the day it was produced and produced for that purpose. Here, the work of art is not a purely visual object, but a thing to be experienced in a particular way, at a particular time, with particular people, etc. Therefore, reproducing the artwork and thereby removing it from its location and setting is an affront to the core meaning of the artwork itself. Even today, photographing the inside of many Renaissance churches, including the Sistine Chapel, is prohibited. Benjamin argues that throughout all of history, artwork was produced for its aura, or its sense of awe that confronts those who experience it. This aura derived from the authenticity or uniqueness of the work, which was tied to its physical as well as socio-cultural location and traditions in which it was produced and situated. Artwork played a central role in collective rituals, where the significance of art was shared not only within the church, but the community as a whole. But as history enters the current epoch, defined by the capitalist mode of production, New material and social relations rapidly redefine the work of art in capitalist society, and a historic break occurs in our traditions and collective rituals surrounding artwork. In terms of material conditions, capitalism generates new technologies for the production of art faster than ever before. Benjamin argues that out of all the artistic innovations since the Renaissance, the camera has had the strongest impact in the way we view art. Before the invention of the camera, Paintings such as Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam could only be viewed authentically, in person. One would need to participate in the setting, in the rituals, in the social relations, in order to view the painting and experience the aura of the art. But the camera liberates the painting from its location, and by extension, liberates the viewer from participating in these traditions and rituals, 
thereby stripping the art of its aura and collective meaning. The camera gives artwork a free-floating existence, removed from the fixity of time and space. As artwork loses its aura by becoming detached from its socio-cultural location, it comes to take on alien qualities whose meaning remains unclear. But capitalism did not radically transform art simply by inventing new material technologies such as the camera. It also introduced profound social relations to the art world, namely commodification. Capital views art as a commodity that can be produced and sold like any other commodity to generate a profit. Art is therefore no longer produced or valued specifically for reasons associated with tradition, ritual or collective meaning but produced solely for its exchange value. The camera is not only a tool of image production, but mass image production, or mass communication for a mass society with mass consumption. Capital maximizes surplus value through mass production and therefore designs art in order to be universally exhibited and reproduced. Art that contains specific meaning will only reach a specific consumer base, but because capital seeks to reach a mass consumer base, it develops art with meaning that is generalizable or vague and can be interpreted and consumed by any particular individual within the mass consumer base. Multiplication of images means the multiplication of context and the debasement of meaning. The creation of Adam is not only removed and reproduced once, but again, and again, and again, and again. This process, which eradicates any semblance of aura or tradition in the artwork, is what Benjamin referred to as the mechanical reproduction of art. He saw that while artwork had historically been a vehicle for social meaning, capital emptied this vehicle to allow for a more ubiquitous and universal consumption of art. The only commonly recognized meaning or ritual of artwork in capitalist societies is in the process of commodification and exchange. The artwork that can be exchanged for money is reproduced, and that which cannot be commodified is simply disposed of or marginalized. Capitalist society is therefore saturated with purely decorative art that has been specifically produced with no other meaning or intention aside from producing surplus value. Capitalism is a visual spectacle of art, but is instilled with nothing but the emptiness of bourgeois consciousness that sees art as nothing more than a commodity. In this way, capitalism turns art into a commodity fetish. Benjamin argues that this form that art takes under capitalist society presents both a great risk but also a great opportunity. He says that mechanical reproduction emancipated the work of art from its parasitic dependence on ritual, which increased the social value of exhibiting art as a cultural practice. A clear example of this was in the Soviet Union, where technologies of mechanical reproduction allowed cultural literacy to widely and rapidly expand to the countryside, thereby democratizing access to art within the peasantry, a population that was historically excluded from consuming cultural products. However, the danger that Benjamin sees in mechanical reproduction of art is what he calls the aestheticization of politics, which he saw as a key characteristic of fascist regimes. He says, Fascism sees its salvation in giving these masses not their right, but instead a chance to express themselves. The masses have a right to change property relations. Fascism seeks to give them an expression while preserving property. The logical result of fascism is the introduction of aesthetics into political life. Fascism recognizes that under capitalism, aesthetics become devoid of collective meaning and can therefore easily be co-opted by instilling fascist discourse into them. Apolitical symbols are stolen from the producers, codified with fascist meaning, and then presented as political aesthetic. In this way, fascism is a many-headed hydra that rears its ugly face in a vast range of subcultures in a shameless pursuit to co-opt the open-ended meaning of art in the current milieu. Benjamin maintains that if fascism is the introduction of aesthetics to politics, it is the task of communists to bring politics to aesthetics. In a society where art is debased and reduced to its exchange value, 
The highest forms of art are those that resist commodification, recover their aura, and produce as well as situate themselves within their own traditions. The highest forms of art are those that cut through the noise of capitalist spectacle and critique the foundation of this system that commodifies everything from art to human life. Communist and other forms of anti-capitalist art are not produced solely with the intention to be submitted into the world of commodities, but are produced in order to undermine and radically transform this system of commodification altogether. In this way, the only authentic art in capitalist societies is revolutionary art, whose aura derives from the political meaning it reflects. Revolutionary art is produced for the usefulness in reflecting the proletarian class perspective and advancing this perspective into the realm of politics. In the face of fascism, such a revolutionary task needs to be seriously dwelled upon. In the words of the Austrian communist Ernst Fischer, in a decaying society, art, if it is truthful, must also reflect decay, and unless it wants to break faith with its social function, art must show the world as changeable and help to change it. This video was made possible by the generous support of the patrons of this channel. If you would like to join them, you can do so at patreon.com slash redpenyoutube.